Joker Filet Adu. Joker 2. It's not Joker 2, it's Joker Filet Adu. Don't call it Joker 2. Use the full title. Show some respect. I mean, it show more respect than it's getting at the box office, I'll tell you. Joker Filet, Filet Adu, am I saying that correctly? A, the sequel to the 2019 Joaquin Phoenix film has scored an unwanted Rotten Tomatoes score as more critics release their reviews of the movie. Initial responses to the premiere at the Venice Film Festival in September were mixed, with some calling it ingenious or beguiling and others finding it dull and laborious. Um, beguiling is what you say when you don't know what to say. True. Among the critics who were who praised the film was the independence, Jeffrey McNabb, who delivered a four-star verdict and wrote, the darkness at the core of this film is underlined by its very brutal ending, which rejects comic book conventions in favor of psychological depth. Well, considering that I... I'm sure there are a lot of people that 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 agree with me on this. Don't look at this as a comic book movie. This is not the Joker. They just slapped a Joker facade on this to to put out a uh, a remake of the King of Comedy uh, with well, elements of Taxi Driver. In it. Okay, but uh, I don't know. I'm I'm sure Warner Brothers is considering this a franchise picture. Um, uh, Phoenix's performance remains powerful and stirring, too. The genius of it is that we can't help but care for Arthur despite his neediness and derangement. The film, which is a musical, also stars Lady Gaga as the Joker's sidekick and love interest Harley Quinn. <clears throat> it had a mo modest early score on Rotten Tomatoes on 61%, as reported by Forbes, placing it as having the same score as the widely derided Black Adam. That now that has now dropped down to just uh, thirty nine percent as the majority of critics laid the boot into the story, songs, and the much talk about ending. The consensus review on Rotten Tomatoes at the time of the writing is Joaquin Phoenix's eponymous Joker takes the stand in a sequel that dances around while the story remains still, although Lady Gaga's wild card energy gives Filet to do some Filet gives Filet to do some nerve. New York Times critic uh, Menahaya Dargis, Dargis writes, uh, the big non-news about Filet Adu is that it's a half-baked, half-hearted musical complete with one star one star who can sing, Lady Gaga as Lee Quinzel, a.k.a. Harley Quinn, and another Phoenix who can't or won't. Audrey Fox on Loop, Looper said, even fans of the Joker are unlikely to find much to redeem uh, this chaotic, profoundly stupid mess. Uh, Richard Roper of the Chicago, Chicago Sun-Times said in his review, there's always a joker, there's always a clown, but if he doesn't morph into something bigger and bolder and more terrible, it starts to feel like we've seen this show before, only without the musical numbers. Uh, Kevin Marr, the Times called the film messy, lifeless, derivative, and exactly what you'd expect from a film that simply doesn't want or need to exist. Um film is set to be the last for Phoenix's Joker. As the premiere, one journalist asked Phoenix about his weight loss for the film, which he said was more complicated than it had been with the 2019 original. Uh, I guess he, in the original, he lost 52 pounds to achieve the lead character's gaunt look and achieve this by eating a diet of basically consisting of seen vegetables and lettuce. Uh, Phoenix was hesitant to reveal specific details about his diet this time around telling reporters I'm not going to talk about specifics of the diet. However, he did say felt more complicated losing weight for the sequel. And there's a lot of dance rehearsal to do. Yeah. What do you think uh, so Nate far? says uh, Joker 2 and Matrix 4 are two movies that look like they were made by people who didn't want to make the movie. Um, that was my... Uh, interpretation based on everything i had heard about this uh joker flail whatever um but uh honestly some other things that i've been hearing are a little bit more insidious in my opinion i think that uh the the the, the director saw this as a Kind of like the the concept that uh, Frank Herbert had for Dune, the idea of the um, you know don't uh, don't put too much faith into you know a human messiah type of story, um, and he was upset by the audience reaction to it, um, 
where people kind of looked at the Joker as a modern day V for Vendetta slash um, Guy Fox, you know, someone mm. who represented the downtrodden of life mm. fighting back against the 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 oppressive state. But if you watch the movie, the original movie, that's a facade because he's a bad person. He just is. He's a bad person that's been abused by the society. That's I understand bad, that. But, but he he but, is not a good good guy in the movie. He's not some avenging angel or anything. That's that's not not that's not how I saw him in the movie. I understand yeah. that. But one tends to project their 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 hopes and dreams onto a figurehead, um, which is fine for a cautionary tale. But it's very tone deaf to not realize that that he created exactly what he was trying to caution people against and he put this out at a time where people really are screaming out to 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 fight against the machine so to speak yes uh that are, they are feeling this kind of oppression they yes. do feel like they need to walk around with a gun to protect themselves because there's nobody else that's going to protect them you know, that, that we can't count on the government to come and feed us and clothe us and get us out of our uh, desperate situation uh, because they're not going to. They've already spent that money elsewhere. And you're on your own and screw you. Here, here's some cash that you can't spend because uh, the, the, the stores have all been washed away and the ones that haven't are completely empty. Good luck. Plus, the, there's a road situation, too. But anyway. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, you know, I mean, it, 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 we're sorry. We, we did other stuff with, the, with all of our resources. We can't help you. And when, when, yeah. when you have that kind of a situation, you make such a tone-deaf movie. And so I think that this movie, is he's trying to correct that by basically kicking everyone in the teeth that liked it in the first place. This so is like, what this is what I've heard. I've not seen this obviously. Congratulations. You're ending your career, buddy. I've not seen this, but the director writer of this movie literally hates the fan of this first movie and is bleeding out all through this movie. This is what I've heard. Uh, this is one of the things I'm trying likely to say on my channel, we have to be careful not to become the thing we hate. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um but anyway, let's get to the next article, too, and that would be... Uh, I, yeah. I love this thing. I, I, people kept saying this scene is not in the movie. <laughs> no, of course it's not. You got. You should all know by now that they create uh, pictures and, and elements for the, the promos that are not going to end up being in the movie. The, the, all the marketing now is lies. It's okay. like you remember that one scene that everyone loves so much? Well, now we're going to add Harley Quinn to that scene. This isn't a box office marketplace problem. This is a creative development problem, declared one movie marketing vet over the weekend over Warner Brothers' um, bold swing at a foul Joker for Lea Doux, which a production cost of $190 million plus net is coming in way below projections at $47 million or less. Friday was $20 million which included previews of that figure. The industry projections are predicting a landslide today for the Todd Phillips directed sequel down some 20%. Um, yeah. And this is another thing I don't understand. I, I, I was talking to Troy about this behind the scenes and I, the first movie was modestly budgeted by modern Hollywood standards and it was R rated and made a lot of money, but also present to its budget. This one, they blew it up to a modern blockbuster standards, and now it's pulling in way less. If they had kept it to the budget of the original, this wouldn't be such an awful loss for them, right? Yeah. We'll talk more about this next week because there are going to be more repercussions. But um, this is an article by Anthony D'Alessandrio. Um, he goes on to say, the fear nowadays in some executive corridors is that headlines for a tent pole that's bombed is some nefarious harbinger for the end of theatrical, particularly after it's been rattled by... Uh, COVID and dual strikes. Um, no, think again. People are still interested in going to movies, evident in how the industry reduced this year's deficit versus the 2023 BO from 20% at the start of the summer to current 11%. You think R-rated comic book movies don't work? Look at what Deadpool and Wolverine did with $1.3 yeah. worldwide. Unseating 2019's Joker, $1.1 billion to become the highest grossing R-rated movie of all time. The failure of Joker for Leia Du is clear as an azure sky of deepest summer. No fan of the original movie wanted to see a musical sequel, Mr. Phillips, period. There isn't enough lipstick to put on this Joker to indicate that it's any kind of a win. 
uh, the original fans of this film, which let's face it, are fanboys and men because they bought the tickets at 60%, kicked this clown to the street with a D cinema score and half star and post track. Anyone feeling megalop megalopolis deja vu from the last weekend, you're not imagining things. The film received a D plus in cinema score. The difference here, of course, is that Warner spent more marketing the zoetrope and Lionsgate to get this Joaquin Phoenix Lady Gaga sequel to some cultural global relevance. No amount of clever marketing, not selling a pick as a musical, selling it as a Joker film could save this. The biggest promotional cardinal sin of them all, uh, launching this sequel, which didn't have the goods at the Venice Film Festival, why would any studio put out a, put a movie out there, particularly with the awful audience scores below, and let it sit on Rotten Tomatoes for a month with bad reviews? Does this not remind you of, maybe it wasn't Venice, was it Cannes, the um, Dial of Destiny debacle, Indiana yep. Jones and the Dial of Destiny? Yep. They... That's a great, great analogy, yes. So things are already coming out ahead of time that it's bad. Uh, sources tell me it was all part of Warner Brothers appeasing Phillips, which is why they allowed him to make this auteurist Stephen Sondheim-like feature in the first place. Between the Hanover, Hangover franchise and Joker, Warner Brothers has reaped $2.5 billion off of Phillips' fare at the box office. What do you what do you do with a director who's done so much for you? Give him final cut. Joker two was put into development by previous Toby Emmerich administration and put into production by the current Michael DeLuca, Pamela Abdi era at Warner Brothers Motion Pictures. So I guess if so, I'm being fair to Zaslav, it probably was put into production before he got there. I want to. Uh, um, there was probably I, contracts signed. Yeah. I want to make a con a comment that may sound hypocritical, but hear me out. I, I will explain myself here. So back when we were talking about Coppola, right, we were saying, look, he doesn't care about the money. It's his money. He made the movie he wanted. He's happy with it. Who cares? Right. But it's his money. That's his money here. It's the investor. This money. is somebody else's money. And, and, and I have a real problem with that. Now I say that, and here's the hypocritical part. I also feel that uh, too many of our franchises have been destroyed, not just by, you know, woke insertions of stuff, but too granular oversight by the studios. And this is not something new. This goes back a long, long way. And somewhere between the studios expressing a concern and an artist knowing his art and his, his audience, you can end up with a masterpiece. You can also have an artist who is too full of himself, doesn't understand his audience, Heaven's and a gate. studio that doesn't understand any of the process, and you end up with a travesty. And I don't know. I think this might be all of the above. Um. Yeah, so um, the movie isn't part of current DC Studios Phase 1 Gods and Monsters. Also compounding the problem here, Joker 2 wasn't tested, which in turn provides a problem when trying to create a marketing strategy. So there are no test audiences for this either, I guess. Um, ha, 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 I'll get I'll get into Phase 1 Gods and Monsters in a minute. I'm also we'll going to argue, article. too, that yeah. we live in an era that's very different than the one I grew up in. Uh, when I was younger you would hear reviews for movies but if they were franchise films or you know somewhat geeky films you knew enough not to listen to siskel and ebert it's like they don't know what star wars is screw those guys right in their defense they liked the star wars movies i don't think they liked it originally yes they, they did did they other okay. critics didn't but they okay. did okay. no they were defending um empire in front of this other movie critic said no no there's good stuff in here they were well, saying empire, even Jedi, I'm they like. star wars star wars i no, i think they gave that one thumbs up maybe it was star trek the motion picture they didn't like well, they they, they well, I, it's kind of hard for me to blame them for that one they that weren't one. terrible the ebert hated they hated horror movies they, they're not all the time some horror movies they like but they would really go after horror movies um but um, we do yeah. live in a different time now yeah. where I think everybody has turned against the institutional uh, uh, reviewers. Uh, 
as being completely out of touch and knowing that they're complete. Well, who are the institutional reviewers at this point? I mean, Kermode, I know he gave it thumbs up, which I don't know what. Well, look at how many of them are actually working for an outlet that is owned by Disney. So they're never going to give a a, a negative review to a Disney film. Yeah. But I'll, I'll say this and I want to go on a tirade in a minute, but I kind of want to get you. What is Warner brothers doing with DC? Oh, they have no freaking clue. I think they have no idea what they're doing. I think they're and trying I have to no set up that they're, James they're, Gunn does either. They're trying to set up a another for the second time because remember they did this once before uh, a Marvel Cinematic Universe style DC universe. And I'm thinking now after this movie came out, can they even put the Joker in a Batman movie now? Right now, well, good point. And and I don't is, know if they had the permissions to do it anyway because of the patents in movies anyway, and this which still always, have to be made. And this always goes back to what I have always said about Warner Brothers going back to before we had, you know, uh, Man of Rust or whatever he was, uh, that whole Snyderverse thing. Yeah. They, they have shot themselves in the foot. They have owned, they never had the situation you, uh, Marvel did. They didn't have their no. rights spewed all over the place. Warner Brothers always owned it 100%. Yeah. And they might, were the ones that decided to not let their peas and carrots touch on the plate. That and might, all they ever yeah. had to do was say, you know what? If you want to work for us, if you want to make our Batman movie, then these are the restrictions. It's got to be a Batman in a shared universe who's going to be part of a Justice League. If you don't like that, we don't want you. Goodbye. Yeah. But to be fair, Nolan was already into the Dark Knight before they even, before the, before Marvel released. I mean, I, Dark Knight and Iron Man came out the same summer. They could have started over when, when, when Nolan was done Warner with his Brothers Dark Knight could trilogy. Have Back in the 80s, if they wanted to. <laughs> yes, well. They have owned these properties from the beginning. They have been playing catch up when they had absolutely no business doing so. If you th- think about it, even with Marvel, the, the, the hills they had to climb over, originally it was like Paramount would release Iron Man, Universal would release Incredible Hulk, and they would tie them in. And like other people, I don't know if Paramount had Captain America and the Hulk, and they had to work See, with these Nate, different Nate, people. Nate's that. agreeing with me. See, I thought I was right. They didn't Did like they? Star Wars the first time. They, well, I don't know. I remember they, they were defending They had to come back Empire. later and say, we've reevaluated. It's not so bad. Well, that's not so Well, that's good if they do that. Well, yeah, I, I get that. I'm just Maybe saying, they saw you, the George Lucas is that edited cut. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> no, I'm being mean. I'm being mean here. But no, um, they can reevaluate. Ebert was kind of weird with Donnie Darko. He he first gave it thumbs up, thumbs down, but he was on the fence. When the director's cut of it came out, uh-huh. he decided to give that version thumbs up because he basically said, you know what? Uh, it, it's one of the few times he actually like basically changed his review. Now, of course, he could still, oh, I'm giving this cut the new the thumbs up, not the old cut. But yeah, you know what I mean. Curtis says, what do you guys think? of this idea not mine but i have been uh pondering it the uh the current hollywood uh managerial class hate the stakeholders trying uh, thinking they are rich fat cats and don't care to make possibly possibly the talent thinks that way yeah i don't know look there is the talent in quotation marks by the way there is so much um uh, lack of awareness and understanding and arrogance in Hollywood. They think we make this stuff. You owe us. We are the royalty. You will pay us. You will, you will, you will eat what we make and like it and say, please may I have some more of that. This is to the fans basically, right? Exactly. Exactly. And if we slap Star Wars on it, if we slap Star Trek on it, these are brands they love. As long as we just keep putting stuff out and changing the name on them, they will pay for it. Yeah. And they are clearly wrong. And they refuse to believe it because they're not spending their own money. They're spending other people's money. 
Um, let's go here. Uh, here's a here's a paragraph about the budget, though. Let me read this, which leads us to the production cost. Some say 200 million. We believe it's 190 million. By the way, that's not the movie going over budget. That's that's what the movie was green lit at. I understand. Yeah. However, how the hell did a budget for a movie which doesn't have a Jack Knight trailer truck stunt a la The Dark Knight and arguably little CGI mushroom from its original cost of 70 million? And that had major co-financers at the time of Village Roadshow and Braun each taking 20%, 25% share to 195 million plus. If the budget doubled to 140 million, that's one thing. But it's clear who was minding the production ledger here during the David Zaslav job cutting, cost cutting, cash flow of Palooza at Warner Brothers Discovery. Sources tell me that between Philip Skog and Phoenix, they repped 50 million of costs. Yep. They each took 50 million. Domain Conax co-financed Joker 2, I hear, to the tune of 25%. That's what he's saying. At least they they, they took $50 million. Uh, and I'm just going to go on to the... There's more to it, but I'm just going to end on, his la- on one of his last lines. What now? Well, the character of Joker in any form needs to go quiet for a while before he dances again on the big screen. And I think, I, I think, I think the author is right here. Because... Let's be honest here. I, I don't know if they can just put the Joker in a Batman movie now after this as a villain. Well, the I think problem they have to is give they it never space should now. have been giving him his own movie in the first place. Yeah, well, I think if they had made it a one and done and we all moved on, that they could have it'd been fine. But th- this is a disaster. It really I, is. I, I, I don't understand Warner Brothers. Even Disney, as much as I don't like them, I, I sort of understand the decisions they make. They're all about this, yeah, this this modern political correctness that they insert. But they, but I'll say this: even they can churn out a Marvel property and a Star Wars property, even now that feels closer to that than anything Warner Brothers does with DC. Yeah. Man, I knew he's talking about Disney and he makes a, a point. He says they're also creating problems so that they can explain them later in a comic or some stuff. Oh, please. And, yes. You know, actually, I, I get why you say it that way, but I think to be more correct, they don't know how to tell a story. So they end up putting out something they think is wonderful. And then the fans come back and point out all the plot holes and why it's stupid. And then they put out a comic book to try and spackle over the cracks. I think it was so expensive because no one really wanted to make the movie, so they all asked for inflated amounts of pay. Why did Lady Gaga get that amount? She wasn't part of the original movie. She didn't have to come back. They could have cast somebody else. Yeah, well, she's she's actually a big name and talented. So so they figured she would be the draw to bring people in. And, but I, I and yeah. maybe she, like like he said, maybe she didn't really want to do this. But you know, if you give me this much, I'll do it. Oh, you're giving me that much. Well, now I guess I got to do it. Um, they have no respect for us. They treat us like the unwashed masses. Yes, they do. Uh, it's it's not about you giving the audience what they want, but what they want to give us, which and is this a, is why which I is to make us feel you, pain when we go to see their which movie. Is fine, because two can play at that game. If they're not going to give us what we want, don't give them what they want. It, don't give them the notoriety. Don't give them the satisfaction. And by God, don't give them the money. It, this is like their. This is like this is like the people running the, the the artists are all masochists and they're trying to inflict pain on the audience and getting off on it. I, I yeah. don't understand this. I don't understand Warner Brothers. And what was their big hit this year? Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. I guess that did all right because they got Tim Burton back for that one. Yeah. I I don't understand Warner Brothers. And you expect me to go rush out and be all happy about seeing a new Superman movie in this in the in the in the summer after all these after all these botched jobs? What what planet are you living on? It has to be better than the uh, Richard Donner movie at this point to get me to want to see it. I know. I know. Let's move on. We'll talk more about this next week. We're not done yet. There's going to be fallout. Well, we're uh, definitely going to be re- revisiting the, um, uh, how do you call it, the uh, the box office next week. Okay. And uh, and yeah. real quick, let's let's say hi to uh, Nikki's Movie House. Welcome uh, to Nikki's movie she's sound. a she's a deleted scenes fan and uh have you seen this movie she stopped in. <laughs> yeah well there you go um as for todd phillips um enjoy spending 200 enjoy having a budget like this you'll never have it again uh, yeah you'll be lucky if they let you direct another comedy at this point um i i don't know i mean i i wouldn't be casting i, I wouldn't be using him again for anything this is ridiculous yeah.